Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Clean Tech. It's a roundup of the week's biggest stories you need to know in climate and clean energy in 15 minutes or less approximately. Today is Friday, June 14th, 2024. I'm Renewable Energy World Editor-in-Chief John Ingle. Michael Thomas, the talented author of Distilled Newsletter, will be joining us shortly. I'm excited for that one, Mike. But for now, I'm joined by PR veteran Mike Casey of TigerCom. Hello, Mike. Hi, John Ingle. How are you? I'm good. You've got a little tan. Have you been getting some sun? I did. I was, uh, we had, uh, I think as we mentioned last week's show, my son was graduating from high school, so we had a lot of family in town, a lot of outdoor time. It was good. You had a big crowd at your house too, right? Yeah, I did. Um, family coming to town is always something. So that'll be the uh, the bonus episode this week will be family time at the Eagle House. Um, but we'll, we'll thankfully move on to our top stories. But hey, we want to thank all of our listeners who keep sending in those story recommendations and nominations for Clean Tech of the Week. You can send those in at rew at clarionevents.com. All right, Mike, go for it. We will. I, I want. There's. We have two announcements. One of them is that nobody, none of our listeners and viewers know that our producer Brian Mendes is a world class rock drummer, and he has agreed to to film himself doing the snare drum roll at the end of the year when the committee select clean tech of the year is going to make its announcement. So we're thanking Brian for that. And uh, the second is we we had a listener, Edmund. Uh, Carvalho told me to slow down because I was talking so fast the last episode. He said it was like being thrown off a roller coaster. So I'm really? going to slow down, John. Yes. Well, so you know, the funny thing is I talk pretty fast and people still speed me up in their iPod, you know, their podcast app. So my tip to him would be that you can actually slow us down as well to a 0.8 speed or 0.5 if you need yeah. to. Yeah. So there, Edmund, keep listening, but take that. Don't tell, you know what, Edmund, I've been doing this long (laughs) enough and I do this out of the graciousness of my heart so that Mike has someone to talk to once a week who's not on his payroll or married to him. And without this, Edmund, Mike would be lost in the woods and I won't allow that to happen. Okay. Um, I love you, John Angle. All right. Story number one, David Baker from Bloomberg wrote the many the world needs more batteries for electric vehicles but not this many that's kind of a that's a that's an awesome headline whoever wrote that headline is uh, bringing it John yeah you could uh, switch out uh, batteries for solar panels here pretty quickly um, in the next couple of years but by 2025 battery factories worldwide are set to produce five times more cells than necessary to meet demand for EVs and battery storage systems. China faces the largest amount of battery overcapacity. They're set to exceed demand by 400% for the decade. And the U.S. and Europe are not far behind this overcapacity. The Biden admin has pushed for a domestic battery supply chain through Inflation Reduction Act incentives and directly with a $9.2 billion loan to Ford last year for three new battery factories. And European governments are subsidizing new battery factories. I throw out my the, the solar example because we know there are gigawatts of Chinese modules sitting all over Europe. Um, and and we, we will likely in the post IRA environment see some overcapacity issues in the US as well for that technology. But I'll let you keep going on the battery thread. Yeah, I, here's a, I think these stories are interesting. And what they tell us, and we've got two of these stories of overcapacity on the show this week by happenstance. And I think what it tells us is the, the what we're doing in the clean energy transition is unprecedented. There, really, there literally is no group of human beings who have ever tried to transition a massive part of the global economy rapidly to meet an existential threat. And, the, and there is no owner's manual for this. It's going to be messy. It's going to be bumpy. And I think that an oversupply in one area is it's all but certain that's going to happen. And this won't be the last time. So this is good news for automakers and EV buyers. But not if we're if we're not careful, overproduction is going to lead to some job losses and factory closures, which we don't want. Plus, we need to avoid heavy investments in the construction of battery factories if they're not going to yield the expected results. So the energy do- transition does require rapid growth, but we also need to do it in a smart, sustainable way to avoid the economic fallout. John, story number two. Yeah, another uh, This Week in Clean Tech alum, Renee Fox from WOSU Public Media. Another Ohio story for you, Mike. House hearing to be held to consider bill to reform how public utility regulators are appointed. I called this one out this week because I thought it was interesting. What did you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the choice because I think we're not trying to do an Ohio focused show here, but it is true, I think, in many ways that Ohio is 
the fulcrum right now of the clean energy transition. It's where a lot of clean energy infrastructure is trying to get built and the incumbent sectors are trying to stop it. And there is no better exhibit on this than the $61 million bribery scandal from First Energy, where they literally paid Ohio politicians to try to stop the clean energy transition. So they're taking what we hope, hope is the operative word, corrective action by convening a House hearing to discuss a bill that would mandate consumer representation on the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, PUCO, as it's otherwise known, has been a wholly owned subsidiary of the utilities that it's supposed to regulate. Um, it, hopefully, we have better, fair-minded management now, and we'll see where this goes. John, what do you think? Only one point that you didn't already cover. So it's past, it's present and previous employees who would not be allowed to serve on the Public Utilities Commission's Commission and anyone who has done business with them. Vendors Amen. too. So I, I do think it's an interesting report uh, approach. Granted, very early days. This is like the first House hearing that that bill has had, but um, I'm optimistic that it'll gain traction. Just given what obviously Ohio has experienced recently. All right, Mike. Number three. Third story. Tom Randall, Bloomberg. Long range EVs now cost less than the average new car in the U.S. I think this is um, I think this is a bit of an inflection point, John. Yeah, a lot of EV news this week. Tesla, Hyundai, Kia, and GM now offer EVs with a range of over 300 miles that can be priced about 25% below an average $47,000 new gas-powered car in the U.S. As EVs become more popular, EV buyers become more aware of the limited battery range, slow charging speeds, and sparse charger accessibility. Those are not good storylines for the transition. Now, technology advancements and cost reductions are rapidly bridging the gap between EVs and traditional gas-powered cars. It's become more feasible for middle-class drivers to, one, buy an EV, to not have to worry as much about range anxiety or charging. Mike, your thoughts? Um, this story hits home for me. I'm I'm uh, entering year 22 of my uh, 2003 Honda Element. It has got almost a quarter million oh, miles. Those on. are I've horrendous kept the- looking cars. They're the best just cars ever so, made, John Engel. Just so ugly. Oh, stop, you snob. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you, I've held on to this because the carbon footprint investment was made when it was made. Oh, to get stuck and- with that embodied carbon on a car that is so ugly, <laughs> as it's a brutal thing. I know you're you're a warrior for this cause, and I appreciate that so much that you had to suffer with a Honda <laughs> Element, which is just a, a block with wheels on it. Um, but I, I digress. Go ahead. You're you're just you're just jealous, John. But I'm going to get back to the story itself. To scale Please it do. quickly, EVs need to be long range and affordable. The industry has been making consistent progress on both fronts. The EV tax credit helps bring down the price as well, but it can be hard for buyers to navigate eligibility for the tax credit and understand which EVs qualify. That makes leasing a more attractive option. Dealers often get the tax credit for selling EVs, and they pass those savings directly to customers by lowering the monthly lease payments achieving savings up at the 37% compared to gas vehicles. So although EVs might not be the top choice for a long distance driver yet, they have become a low cost, efficient options for everyday drivers like me. John, our fourth story. You're certainly better than a Honda Element. Okay, our fourth story is written by Malcolm Moore at the Financial Times. World faces staggering oil glut by end of decade, energy watchdog warns. Mike. Too much I'm oil? trying to ke- I'm trying to keep a straight face here as I'm realizing that my dear friend John Engel is is kind of a materialistic snob. I did no, not know that. No, 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 now. no. Mike, you misunderstand. My favorite part of doing the show is getting you off the rails so that you can't focus or, or read your your lines. And it, usually it's quite easy, to be honest with you. I don't you're, you're, I don't read my you're lines. You're not a very all resilient this, asset. All of this is spontaneously generated out of out of this brilliant mind, John. But anyway, we digress. The IEA projects that if oil companies continue to increase production, they could see over 8 million barrels of oil per day in spare capacity by the end of the decade. This year, OPEC's market share dropped to its lowest level since 2016 at 48.5% due to competition from the U.S. and their voluntary production cuts to stabilize oil prices in November. Remember all that that jawboning about, gosh, we're we need more, the oil companies need more things for Trump? Well, they've been, never been producing more of their product on earth in history. And this is the chickens are coming home to roost here. 
Oil extraction is becoming an increasingly risky event endeavor as clean tech alternatives continue to improve. We like that. Uh, just like we saw in the last story about EVs. John? Yeah, and I'll just round it out with oil demand is forecasted to peak before 2030 due to EVs, Middle Eastern countries desire to switch from oil to renewables and slower economic growth in China. But oil producers are continuing to start new drilling projects that will take years to pay off. Would be such a shame, Mike, to see those stranded assets. Okay, number five (laughs) and our reporter this week. I'm excited for this. Michael Thomas from Distilled, get on here. The rise of the clean energy mega project. I've been a fan of this guy's reporting for a while. Yeah, me too. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Mike. I appreciate right. it. We this asked is, this, this question. is the point of regret that I always shout out um, <laughs> on the show when we get to number five and the person who's been off camera for 10 minutes goes, whew, I made some choices today. Uh, but he, is love, he is loving being on the show. Mm. Don't speak for him. I'm John. having a great time. Okay. Good. See, good. I told you. All right. Michael, we always ask this question. Uh, we want everybody to read your story, but if they haven't yet, this is the first time they're hearing about it. What's the big takeaway? Yeah, so the big takeaway with this story is that clean energy and storage projects are getting really, really big. So just to put a couple numbers on this, um, solar projects are about six times bigger on average than they were a decade ago. In the case of wind, um, they are three times bigger than just two decades ago. Um, and in the case of batteries, uh, obviously here, this is the, the biggest shift in, in such a short time. Um, they are 15 times bigger than they were just five years ago. Michael, what would you say is the reason for this transition? I mean, we talk all the time about transmission interconnection queues just being a mess. Um, siding is getting a lot harder too, as, as developers, the common refrain is all, often all the good land has been gobbled up and it's getting a lot more difficult especially with the interconnection um, issues tied into there. So what's what's the dynamic here that we need to be watching for? Yeah, so I think that there's three different reasons in, in each of these. So in the case of solar, um, there's a number of, of reasons why projects are getting bigger. One of the main ones I'd say is that uh, there's huge economies of scale that come with building large projects. So um, I cited in my story some research from one of the national labs that found that uh, small projects, uh, five to 20, watt, or 20 megawatt hours, are about $1.26 per watt um, of installed cost. And then big projects, which are, I believe their number was 200 to 500 megawatts, uh, those were 82 cents per mega or per watt. Um, so you're getting a lot more bang for the buck when you're building a, a large project. Um, and obviously, cost is a, is a big driver of all of this. Um, in the case of wind, there's another uh, element at play, which is that for the first time, the United States is actually building offshore wind farms. Um, we've had one that was a very small project in Rhode Island, but other than that, have almost no offshore wind industry to speak of in this country. And that's finally shifting um, with the projects on the East Coast. So we've got a 2.6 gigawatt project coming online um, in Virginia um, and a couple more in the Northeast. So that's driving it. Another one in the case of wind is transmission infrastructure. So we're finally building these large projects like Sun Zia and TransWest that's bringing power from the windy plains in the middle of the country to the demand centers in Arizona, uh, Nevada, and California. And then um, in the case of batteries, uh, it's actually just the case of a shift in role. So uh, about five years ago, most batteries were playing these niche grid services, doing things like balancing and ancillary services. And today, um, they're really storing power and discharging it at uh, times of peak demand. So their role has really shifted. Michael, is there a, a, something of a ceiling in sight in the, among the people you talk to for a story like this? I think if we look just at the data uh, of what's coming online in the next couple of years, um, in the case of uh, solar, we're going to still grow much larger. So Uh, I looked at what's in the interconnection queues across the country and found that the average project coming online over the next two years is 125 megawatts. And that's by comparison to 65 megawatts today, which is already that 6x number I mentioned at the top. Um, In the case of wind, uh, it's going to go up to 220 megawatts. uh, So that's an increase of 20%. And then in the case of batteries, um, going up 90 or to 90 megawatts compared to 60. So for the next two years, really no end in sight. Um, Beyond that, I think is really anyone's guess. 
Michael, one last question, and we might run a little long here just because I'm curious, but I, I, I really like your work because I think it kind of straddles the trade media world a little bit, which I'm in, and then, you know, bridges that gap between mainstream reporters that we have on here all the time and that it provides that extra level of depth without maybe disenfranchising people who aren't in the industry. So kudos to you for being able to do that for one, because I know that's hard. Very broad question. Over, say, take take the last year, you get to operate independently, you write about what you want to write about. What What is one of the, the more interesting stories that you followed, whether on the project devel- development side, I know you cover community engagement stuff too, but i um, interested if, if you could just give us a peek behind the curtain. Yeah, I think uh, the probably the most interesting story that I've, I've worked on over the last couple of years is the um, larger story of local opposition. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before uh, the show. And I think this is one of the major challenges that uh, solar wind battery developers are facing. Um, I did a lot of reporting about a year ago, looking at some of the money behind these projects. And then also just some of the grassroots groups, people uh, like Kevin Martis in uh, Michigan, um, and, and some of these uh, what are called, they sometimes refer to themselves as anti-wind or anti-solar warriors. And, um, and there's just a lot of folks who are getting um, really upset about large projects coming into their communities. And I think it's one of the biggest issues facing uh, the clean energy industry. And um, I think it's also a really complicated story because it's not just big oil is paying people to yeah. oppose projects. And, and in some cases, there's environmental groups that are opposing it for reasons like, um, you know, protected animals or species. And I think that there's really complex trade-offs and challenges in, in assessing whether a project should go on land of an endangered species and the tension between climate and biodiversity goals. All right, John, we're just about out of time. We need to go to our clean checker of the week. I want Aaron Petrie, our first listener, to be on your LinkedIn page, blaming you for us going over 15 minutes, John, not I, me. I said so. we do it in approximately 15 minutes right at the top because I knew I would give <laughs> Michael an extra question that had nothing to do with his story this week, um, which I'm I'm known to do. Uh, this week's Clean Tech of the Week is Andrew Savage, Vice President and Founding Team at electric vehicle and bike sharing company Lime. Last year in Tel Aviv, they launched swap stations to allow riders to swap low charge batteries for fully charged ones. They swapped over 165,000 batteries, earning them an estimated $675,000 and reduced vehicle trips by nearly 100,000 kilometers or 62,000 miles. So congratulations to Andrew, this week's Clean Tech of the Week. Andrew Savage, he's a, he is a good person, man. I got to tell you, I know him. You should introduce um, me to him and see if he wants to do a podcast. I can do that. All right. No, I after mean, I, I, me, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, for you. Your, I mean, for your spot, Mike. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. After I Venmo you, I'm going to Venmo you 150 bucks for being my friend. That's oh, that should that. be keeping it going. Great. All right, good. We want to thank our wonderful producer Brian Mendez and Claire Quirin and Alex Peterson for helping gather these stories. Yeah, big thank you to you as well, Michael Thomas, for joining us on this episode of this week in clean tech. Please do go check out his newsletter, Distilled, and subscribe to this podcast. Give us feedback and share your story recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michael. See you, John Engel. Thanks for having me.